Hello, and thank you for listening to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Our featured guest today is part of a series of podcasts that focus on country music and faith, with stars of country music sharing their stories and their connection to Jesus Calling. T. Graham Brown is a legendary country music singer whose unique story and voice are still making an impact today. As part of the celebration of country music artists and faith, Jesus Calling will have a booth at 2017's CMA Music Festival in Nashville, Tennessee. If you're planning on attending, visit us at Fanfare X in the Music City Center from June 8th through 11th. You'll be able to meet some of the artists who have been on our podcast, win free Jesus Calling products, and more. For more information, check out the Jesus Calling Facebook page for details. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we talk with legendary country music artist T. Graham Brown. Graham Brown has recorded over 13 studio albums and charted more than 20 singles on the Billboard charts. He talks candidly about his life and his struggles with addiction and the song that became a prayer that changed everything. My family's in agriculture. We got a farm in Georgia, been in our family seven generations. I learned how to drive on a John Deere, one of those old two-cylinder popping Johns that sounds so good. All these guys are writing songs about John Deere tractors and all singing about John Deere. Hey, that's, I'm, I was there. I did it. Daddy worked his way through the University of Georgia. To put himself through Georgia, he was a mailman downtown Athens. He walked a route had a leather mail bag and, and, you know, took the mail to all the businesses downtown. So that's the way he uh, went to school and went to night school, I think, for four years. And then my mother went to work and put him through the last two years full time. He was one of the first ones in his family to graduate from college. In his immediate family, he was the only one. And, uh, Moved us down to South Georgia, this little bitty town called Araby, Georgia, 70 miles south of Macon. He built a grain elevator, and we were into wheat and corn and rye. And had a, a, a mill there that we made hog feed and, you know, different kinds of feed. And it was just uh, country. I wanted to get back to a big town, which was Athens, so Daddy sold out his thing and moved us back to Athens and we were able to finish high school there. My brother and I got one brother. And we both went to the University of Georgia. I worked my way through and uh, daddy and mama paid my brother's way. Met Sheila. A friend of mine brought her to hear me sing and uh, she went to sleep. Sheila threw the Atlanta Constitution seven days a week, paper out, get up at like three in the morning, go down, fold papers, put rubber bands around them, bam, bam, seven days a week. Then she ran a research barn at the University of Georgia, and then she went to school. She's got a master's degree in dairy science and uh, animal nutrition. She was admitted to vet school there, which is the hardest vet school in the United States to get in. So she was gonna be a vet, and, we were living on one of the old houses on our farm. She came home one day, she drove a University of Georgia pickup truck, had a little decal on it, it was an old one from the 60s, and this would have been in the 80, early 80s. Came home one day and said, let's move to Nashville. I said, wow, really? What about vet school? And she said, hey, I can always come back. She said, if we don't go, you'll never forgive yourself. You'll be wondering the rest of your life, what if, what if. So, like six weeks later, we were here. We had a 63 Volkswagen and a 1959 Ford station wagon. That's what we moved all our junk up here in. That was in spring of 82. I started singing demos. They were pitching these songs all around town and my voice got passed around town. So that's how people knew me. It was like, uh, hey, this, this song's good, but who's that guy singing? So it kind of got to be that way. And then Capitol Records signed me. I would have been here two years, maybe. I went to Chicago. It was the first commercial I'd ever sung. And uh, I take that back. The guys from Chicago came to Nashville. And it was a McDonald's commercial that was on the uh, Super Bowl. It was the first million dollar minute. I don't know what they charge for a minute now. It was millions and millions, but 
It was the first million dollar minute. It was a hit. Like Then I got another job, and I got another, and I wound up. I've probably sung as many jingles as anybody in history. McDonald's and Hardee's and Burger King, and KFC and Taco Bell. I was the Taco Bell guy for four years on TV too. I sang about everything. I was like the guy. I was like the male demo singing guy. I was the go-to guy. As T. Brown began to make his name known in the music world, he also began to see the damage that his longtime addiction to alcohol was beginning to have in his life. T shares how his faith in God was always present, even through the darkest times, and how God answered his prayers through a life-changing song. I've always been a believer. I was raised in a Baptist church. My, my mother's folks were there every time the doors were open, a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, you know, Sunday, Sunday night. I mean, I was always taught about Jesus. And I don't think even in my drunkest days, I don't think I ever missed saying my prayers at night. I don't really remember ever not doing that. I've always said my prayers. But anyway, it just got to where I was getting up in the morning and pouring vodka in my coffee before I'd brush my teeth. And I figured, hey, this is getting serious. I was always able to work. Very few, I mean like a, less than 10 times was I really drunk on stage where I probably shouldn't have been on stage. And that's out of a thousand shows. But I'd get home and the first thing I'd do when the bus would get in on the way home, I'd stop in the store and get a six pack of tall Budweiser's or a 12 pack and it'd usually be Sunday morning and I'd go out in the river and wade and fish and drink. And, I was ignoring Sheila and our son. I didn't really realize it. But I was putting them through a bunch of bad stuff and uh, unbelievably she stuck with me. If I'd have been her, I'd have left me a thousand, a hundred times. I guarantee you I would have walked out. I got called into Capitol Records one time and my, Mr. Fogelson, one of the decent men in the record business, here, he said, Brown, I'm gonna drop you. If you don't quit, I'm gonna drop you. And I said, okay. And I quit for a while. I would get on the horse and ride a while and fall off and get on the horse and ride a while and fall off. I scared a bunch of people. Thought I was dying, that I was gonna... I should have been face down in a ditch a long time ago, really. I mean, there were so many times that I OD'd and should have been dead. I've done everything there is to do, not just drinking. If it exists, I've done it. I wrote Wine Into Water with Bruce Birch and Ted Hewitt, and Bruce is a hit songwriter. He's had multiple number ones as a writer. And that song turned out to be about me. I mean, we didn't realize it. They knew I was in trouble, but we didn't write it for me. It just turned out to be about me. Could you help me turn the wine back into water? Could you help me turn this wine back into water? So I wouldn't sing it, man. I was drunk. I couldn't bring myself to sing it. It was a prayer. That's all that song is, is a prayer. Please, please help me. I'm at the bottom of my rope. Please, please, at the end of my rope, I, I need your help. And that's the whole song, that's it. And it was five years, I guess. Sheila kept trying to get me to sing it, and I, uh, I, I couldn't sing it because it was a lie, you know. I don't go against God, buddy. I don't lie to God. You can't con God. See, some people think you can con God. God knows what you're thinking. You can't con God. That's just a fact. And, and you're just fooling yourself if you even 
think you can or try to. So anyway, finally one night, Sheila, I don't even remember this, but Sheila said we were out at Loretta Lynn's house and I sang it. And it went over. Really, everybody liked it. And um, Loretta started singing her shows. As a matter of fact, Loretta put it on her last album, came out last year. And that song, it's been covered a hundred times. I mean, it's it's gotten out there. Anyway, I sang it, and then I would get drunk again, and then I would get sober again, and I was pitiful. I looked in the mirror one day, and I was looking at myself, and I said, man, what are you doing? This is crazy. You're fixing to blow everything. I said, well, I asked God, I, I need some help on this deal, because I'd qu tried and quit, you know, I'd gone through different periods of sobriety, but it never took. So I quit. It's been wonderful. God is very patient. He's just sitting there waiting on you till you come around. He's there, you know, he's been there all the time, you know, just waiting for you to come to. I talk about it in my shows. Every show, I tell people there's a way out. I used to think it was just me, but I figured out, finally, that everybody is just like me or knows somebody really close to them just like me. So that song hits everybody. I hear it from people. It shows every show. People leave it on Facebook. This football player came up to me in Florida State Fair. This guy said, man, I smoked some crack. I went through my money. My wife and kids left me, I had three kids. He said, I lost my job. They took my house away. Anyway, he pulled his truck out into a field and hooked a um, hose up to the exhaust and ran it in his cab and turned the radio on and bam, wine into water came on right then. He'd never heard it before. He said he started crying. This is over crack, this ain't over drinking. He started crying, took it all down. His wife and kids came back. It's, the, it's just the American dream thing. His wife and kids came back, got his job back, got another house, got it, made some money, put it in the bank. It's one of those things, okay, it was meant to be. There's this old saying, I'm just glad I was holding a pencil. You know, when inspiration hits you. You're just in the right place at the right time in the right frame of mind and hey man, you know, the Holy Spirit takes over. That's the whole thing. We'll be right back with more of T. Graham Brown on the Jesus Calling Podcast after this short message. As a special offer to you, the listeners of the Jesus Calling Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Find your favorite Sarah Young title, including Jesus Calling and Jesus Always, in an audiobook version, and get it for free by trying audible.com. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling. Again, that's audibletrial.com Jesus Calling for your free audiobook. Sheila and I are part of this church building ministry called International Cooperating Ministers. We build churches around the, the globe in third world countries. But our personal ministry is helping people get sober and stay sober. That's what we're all about. I get on stage, that's what I'm about. I don't get up there and hit people over, beat people over the head with the Bible or anything like that. I just tell people the, the, the truth. Here, here's the way it was. And this is how I changed. It can happen to you, basically. It's not that hard. It's pretty simple. It's really deceptively simple. Uh, but people try to make something hard out of it. Jesus taught so simple a third grader could understand it. Jesus wasn't complicated. He, I'm serious. He could, he could get on the level that anybody can understand it. Jesus calling, it's... Basic truths, daily devotionals are good if it gets you out of the, all this mess and then lets you concentrate. And I think the whole purpose is, hey, you're not alone. 
it's kind of basic. You're not alone. Everything's going to be all right if you try this and this, and uh, don't beat up on yourself. That's a good thing. God ran me up through all this. I can talk the talk because I have walked the walk. I've been there. The good news is, don't matter what you're doing, you can be forgiven if you repent. If you're serious about it and really want forgiveness, instead of just saying, oh, I want forgiveness, and that's it. I mean, you got to try. T. Graham has seen lives change by the power of God and the words of that simple song that became his prayer. He and his wife, Sheila, have gone on to do work that benefits the International Cooperating Ministries, an organization that builds churches and communities all over the world. He's recently recorded a gospel album with several country and gospel music greats. Proceeds of the record entitled, Forever Changed, go to this church building ministry. Marty Rabin, who is a, a godly guy, a great singer, uh, was the lead singer and still does some shows with a band called Shenandoah. And really good guy, Christian guy, and sings great. So he cut this album, and there's this old song called Working on a Building. It's been around since probably the 40s. Been cut a million times. So Marty Raven cut it, and then so this guy Mark Carmen had this idea. He said, man, let's call up a couple of guys and make it a quartet. So they called up Trace Atkins to sing bass, and Jimmy Fortune was in the Statler Brothers for years, Christian guy, great voice, sings up high. They got him, and then they got me, and Marty's voice was already on there. They put a time-lapse video on it of us, of uh, uh, some native people. I don't know if they were in Haiti or where they were. And it's a time-lapse of them building this little bitty churches, which is all we do, four walls and a roof mainly, where people can come in out of the weather and have a service. We don't build fancy churches. So Mark said, man, you know, we ought to do a record that benefits ICM. And I said, hey, I'm in. And Mark said, you know, Vince Gill would sound good on this. So I've been knowing Vince Gill since 85, I guess. I knew that Vince would say yes because he says yes to everything. He never turns anybody down. He's always there to raise money. He's one of these guys, you know, you've heard of these guys that are too good to be true. Well, Vince is true. Man, the Oak Ridge boys just sound good. Call them up, bam, they were there. It was like, it wasn't like, let us think about it. it that's one thing. None of this was, hey, let us think about it, you know. They were all bam. Jason Crabb, one of the greatest gospel singers ever. So the, we got the Oaks come in, and then we got Jason to come in, and then I called Leon Russell, my old Rock and Roll Hall of Fame buddy that I'd sung on his records 30 years back. And he's such a sweet guy, God rest his soul. Anyway, so we did all this, and it turned out really cool. I never really could put my finger on the Holy Spirit, but... During that album, I could. It was everywhere. It was like, this is ordained by God, this whole project, I think. You know, it was like, man, this is too weird. Everything's falling in place perfectly. We didn't have any plan, any idea. We weren't trying to go out. You know, we were just trying to make a neat little record. So... We didn't know where we were going to sell it. So then, bam, Sony out of New York came in the form of Sony Red, this big distribution arm of Sony. Then they took over the manufacturing, the marketing, the distribution, and then Cracker Barrel put it in their stores, which is huge. And then we got a Grammy nomination on it. We weren't shooting for that. That wasn't even on our radar. Actually, none of that stuff was on our radar. We figured this was going to be a little homemade deal. And I know that we send money to uh, International Cooperate Ministries. It was great. Man, I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. Sheila and I are happy. It's just strong. It's amazing. And we've been married since 1980. Man, she put up with me a long time. I asked her, why? 
and she said, I just knew you were going to come around. I just knew you had some, something to do. To find out more about T. Graham and the Forever Changed album, please visit tgrahambrown.com. Next time on the Jesus Calling podcast, we visit with another country music legend, Colin Ray. Colin was one of the true country hit makers in the 90s. He's had 24 top 10 records, 16 number one hits, and was nominated as Male Vocalist of the Year 10 times. Colin shares the heartbreak of losing his 10-year-old granddaughter and how he had to trust God through the pain. Haley was born, we thought, healthy, total. Her birth was great. There was no problems. And to make a long story short, she had a, uh, a neurological disorder and, and no one could ever diagnose it. We never got a diagnosis and boy, we tried. I took her everywhere. And when she got to about, well, I guess six, it really started spiraling down. And you know, we, so we started having to face the fact this could be fatal. In 2010, she was uh, nine, almost 10 years old. And uh, she, she passed away most horrible thing ever happened to us, you know. You can't survive something like that. You can't, I, I mean, not, not may, maybe physically, but you can't emotionally or mentally. Our faith was strong. And so even in the midst of, of that, I knew, as did my daughter, we knew that he was in charge of it and he wanted her back. Today's featured passage comes from the September 23rd entry of the Jesus Calling audiobook. Walk with me in the freedom of forgiveness. The path we follow together is sometimes steep and slippery. If you carry a burden of guilt on your back, you're more likely to stumble and fall. At your request, I will remove the heavy load from you and bury it at the foot of the cross. When I unburden you, you are undeniably free. Stand up straight and tall in my presence, so that no one can place more burdens on your back. Look into my face and feel the warmth of my love light shining upon you. It is this unconditional love that frees you from both fears and sins. Spend time basking in the light of my presence. As you come to know me more and more intimately, you grow increasingly free. Hear more great stories about the impact Jesus Calling is having all over the world. Be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling podcast on iTunes. We value your reviews and comments so we can reach even more people with the message of Jesus Calling. And if you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.